it's the next level. He hasn't stopped playing her since we got back from Snowpiercer. Snowpiercer. That was the only best day of my life. He has lost his mind. Do you see what he has us reading? I know. His Audrey was so dazzling. He's pining for her. His great love. Welcome back to the show, panelers. I'm Steve. And I'm Daphne. And this is a spoilerful podcast of Snowpiercer Season 2, Episode 5, Keep Hope Alive. And I think somebody actually said that during the episode, which I, I should have noted. But the synopsis for this episode is Leighton and Miss Audrey make a risky play for Big Alice, but Wilford has his own plan. Ooh. I don't know who's writing these IMDb uh, <laughs> synopsis, but these are good. These Snowpiercer ones are really good. They don't give too much away. They give yes. you the story, and that's really all you all you need. So I'm starting to uh, to appreciate these uh, even more. I think I've I've said that several times with Mark. <laughs> but tell me, Daphne, what were your initial thoughts for Keep Hope Alive? Well, you know, I feel like this episode gave us a little bit more of kind of the yin and yang or the flip side of each Snowpiercer and Big Alice. Mm -hmm. We see Snowpiercer and you see Layton's building this big, he's trying to build hope amongst people. He's trying to give them something to look forward to. And we see that multiple times in this episode. Whereas if you go over on Big Alice, I feel like, I feel like Wilford is leading more, of an iron fisted, do your job, no questions asked, fear motivated leadership. And so I feel like we're getting that two different sides of a leadership strategy. I would not want to be on Big Alice living under that, uh, like that dictator, like. <laughs> yeah, because it's, it's, no, the thing is, the, the, the problem I think we have with Big Alice is we haven't seen enough of the day-to-day -day outside of these five people. Mm -hmm. You know, like we, we, we've we just basically seen the people who went over to Snowpiercer in the last episode. Those are really the only that we've kind of seen what their life is like. We haven't, but we get enough of it that you're right. I mean, it's basically you just, you. it's like you wake up, you eat your gruel, you do <laughs> your job, whatever, whatever your menial job is, unless you're a Headwood doctor, unless you're one of those guys, you know, you get up, you eat your gruel, you do your job, then you eat more gruel and then you go to bed. In a bunk. And then you get the next, yeah. In, in like a bunk that's, that's maybe a little bit bigger than like what you would have on like a Navy ship or a submarine or something like that. And, and yeah, it's, so we haven't seen the class system really on Big Alice that we have on Snowpiercer and that they're trying to break down on Snowpiercer, but it's, it's, they're not doing it very well, you know? So we haven't really seen if there's anybody like in a first class kind of position besides Wilford. And we see Wilford, you know, in his, <laughs> yeah. I was just going to say, Wilford is definitely above yeah. first class. He gets what he wants when he wants it. He's got the finest mm -hmm. clothes, the finest food. Alex, I feel like, gets to t partake mm -hmm. in some of that. But for the most part, it's kind of, he's got that huge mm -hmm. car and he does and he's what just he by wants himself in and there. And even Alex just comes in yeah. when it's time to do her job, you know, do her shift of, of driving yeah. the, the, the train. So, yeah, that's, that's interesting. It is very different. Uh, for me, another episode without Melanie, and I was not happy. And, you know, yeah, I and she's not Melanie. even listening to the credits this time. Like, I, I looked for it. Like, I was oh. just it went right from David Diggs to Mickey Summer, who's the one who plays Till. And I was like, 
wait a minute, oh, they didn't even goodness. list Jennifer Connelly. Like I kept, I, I backed it up and <sighs> I was like, they didn't even, man. So I hope, I really hope we're going to get, we're going to get her back very soon and we're going to get to see, I hope we don't go this whole season without seeing her. You know, I hope these, these I last, know. whatever it is, there's, we got about, I think it's a 10 episode. So we're halfway through, Steve. This is the yeah, halfway point. If if we have to go until the end without seeing Melanie, I'm going to be very disappointed in in the storytelling. Or they better make up for it with story, I guess. You know, she has always been such a force to be reckoned with. Mm-hmm. All of that time that she spent keeping people thinking that Wilford was alive. I mean, that took a lot of effort and energy, and she really kept things going without really getting wound up mm-hmm. she was always like this even keeled leader right on snow piercer and she kept things in order and i feel like without her i think i mentioned it last week i just feel like wilford's waited for her to leave so he can start mm-hmm. messing with things exactly exactly and that's what we get in this episode really we were talking about it before we started recording that there's a lot in this episode that happens it's this is a big episode i you know it's 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 there's no doubt that it's the middle of the season because this is huge and again but no melanie it just was not i was not happy with yeah that, so. i feel like we got a lot of little parts and pieces mm-hmm. and we're starting to put this big puzzle together and i yeah i'm really interested to see where it goes there's a lot of potential mm-hmm and like you, I really hope that we don't have to wait to the last episode to get Melanie back. Yeah, I hope I hope not. But it sounds like they're going to go back to pick her up. They're going to be turning around to go back and yeah, pick her up. Yeah, and it's only like three days. So I hope they don't drag out three days over several episodes. You know, I hope like well, like maybe the next episode we have. Well, no, the next episode we got to get the aftermath of. Well, th- let's just, we got to get into our top five. There's so much. <laughs> You know, Steve, I feel like we could talk about all these little things all day long and the episode to be about six hours long. Exactly. Exactly. So let's let's get this 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 pun intended train back on the track. And as I as I do every week, because I am a gentleman, you may go first. (laughs) Okay. well, my number five, I'm calling Bye Bye Breachman. Mm. And my question is, why would Wilford take them out? Because they are loyal to him. Does he not know they're loyal to him? Did he take them out because they're the toughest on Snowpiercer and he's afraid, oh, they might be against me, so I need to take them out? Or does he Mm -hmm. think, well, they wouldn't expect me to take them out, so I'm going to take them out to show how powerful I am? And then the Headwoods and their little conversation that Josie overhears talking about... The Breachman. But it's mm-hmm. very, it's really cryptic. It's very cryptic. Yeah, I actually had that in my notes because it is very, when I watched it the first time, you know, and then we see the aftermath, we go, oh, they're talking about that the Breachman were going to do something. But they, when I watched it the second time, I realized they're really talking around just the fact that the Breachman, something's happening you know, maybe, I don't know. That's why I'm confused. This whole, and uh, yeah, it's just. Uh. I went back and I actually slowed it down and I went through what they actually said. Okay. And so the conversation went like this. Wilford pushes and pushes and he won't lose. It's starting tonight. The Breachman, he's using them so early. So I assumed using them at that time meant he was going to take them and they were going to be taking control of things. Mm -hmm. But that word using. Yeah. So here's, here's, here's my take. Here's my take because uh, grammatically the pronoun them should apply to the Mm breach. If you're following grammar, proper grammar, but what if it doesn't, what if the breachman was just a statement and then the next sentence, they're using them so early, is the other, the hooded. Right, that we've never even that heard of. That we don't even know who they Ooh. are. It's his other. And maybe, 
maybe this is a play. I, I don't, again, it's, it's one of those things because see the breachmen are kind of like the firemen, right? Yes. Like they, they're the ones that when that, when that, uh, when that uh, car in season one got smashed and the snow was going, they were the ones that suited up and had to go in there to repair that car so that the train could keep going. Yes. You know, without have you know, and so losing them is a pretty big deal. It is to Snowpiercer, and and Wilford can Wilford then use that as a chip and show that Layton is losing his control. I again, I don't know because unless, like you said, maybe Wilford didn't know they were loyal to him, and then. And then there's Boki, who survived. Only only because he was being questioned by Leighton. Exactly. Yeah, Leighton and Roach, they, they, they're they coming up the hallway just as that hooded figure is about to go in there to take Boki out. And the, and whoever it is leaves. Uh, so, when I was watching it, I didn't realize like how significant mm-hmm. that was until they went in and we saw yeah. all the others dying. Exactly. It wasn't until my second watch that I realized, oh, that's what was going on there. Because you see that guy walk out just as Leighton and Roach are walking in. So I was like, oh, okay, now I get it. But yeah, this is a, a very confusing, and this was actually my my number one uh, now that I look back at, at my notes. So let me see if there's anything else that I haven't um, I did think it was kind of cool that I think uh, Leighton called where they work out or where they were living muscle breach. Yeah, that was kind of funny. Was, I like I liked I that, that as well. Um, but yeah, and yeah, who you know, this is the other question because at the begin- very beginning of the episode, the the hospitality person tells Wilford that our friend up train lit the lantern. Yes. Whatever that Who means. is the friend up train and what is the lantern? Mm-hmm. Like what lantern? Right, right. And how did they, how was she able to see it? Was it when the door opened? Was it, you know, because uh, it's so many things that are just like. We have to, what's we happening? have to figure them <laughs> out. And the last thing that the doctor's head would said was we could lose some good tech we could lose some good subjects too soon. And so with that, I was thinking, was he thinking that because mm. the breachmen are bigger, he wanted mm-hmm. more icy bobs? Mm. I don't know. Interesting. Because so if they, if they knew the target was the breachmen and that it wasn't the breachmen doing the targeting. Yes. Then that would make that statement would make sense because they're losing their they're going to lose their test subjects. But it also means that Wilford let them in on the plan because I I had another thought about that. I wondered if there was some misdirection going on in that conversation that Wilford trying to draw the spy out. Like he's going to figure out who the, he's going to figure out that Josie is the spy because because she sent the note about the breachman. So maybe the conversation was meant to make her think the breachman were going to do something. And then that doesn't happen, but yet that's what Leighton thinks. And then I just, my head's going to explode. I know, I know, I know. It's so (laughs) hard to try to figure it out. And there's so much that happened in this episode and it's all these little pieces. And I know some people when they're watching TV, they're not super excited about things in an episode where a lot of little things happen, but it doesn't seem like things are moving forward. Mm -hmm. Although I think we got a lot in this episode. We got a a whole bunch, a whole bunch that moved us, that moved, that did move things forward, you know? And I thought, yeah, that's, it's just, it's one of those things that I think it's like our generation were, getting the best of both worlds we know what binging is but we also remember what it was like to have to wait Mm -hmm. a week in in between you know and so there's this whole this whole thing of of on one hand i'm really excited i wish i want to see the next episode now but there's also that same anticipation that i remember having you know when i was younger when you had to actually had to wait yeah. a week for the next for the next show or sometimes you had to wait months depending on hiatuses and seasons ending and stuff so um, it's a lot of build up it's exciting a lot of build it up is. and it's i exciting. like that about episodic tv 
when you're building yes. up to that every week. Absolutely. So, yeah. So, um, what was your number five? So, my number five is just intelligent icy Bob. Oh. What the heck? Like, <laughs> like, the first time I heard someone speaking to Josie, I was like, who is talking to her? I said, the only person. <gasps> yep. And I'm like, and it's like, it's, he's not like talking even like that he has a disability. He's talking very clearly, very concise sentences. You know, he's like, he's very calm. He explains to her how to calm her panic attack down. He's like, look at five things in the, in the room. And was he holding the same book that book club was reading? Was it Rebecca? I'm not sure. About okay. that. I, but I can tell you that what he was telling Josie to do is actually legitimate uh, panic attack protocol. It's something you can do to calm yourself down. Usually it's look nice. for five things you can touch, five things uh -huh. you can see. I can't remember the exact order, but it is legitimate. Right. It is legitimate what that's he was a, talking that's about. A, cool. Well, that's, 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 and so. I see Bob. So then he takes the pain pills from her. I'm not exactly sure why he did that, but he also was very like, don't tell the Headwoods about me. And so it's almost like they don't know that he has this clarity. They don't, they, they don't realize that he actually is this intelligent, you know, he's not brain damaged or whatever they expect. I, I don't know. It was, it was, it just blew my mind. Every time he came into a scene, I was like going, this is not like, this is not at all what we expected of this character. When we saw him attacking people in the train, this isn't what we, when we saw the head was ex experimenting on him and Wilford, you know, just watching him suffer and saying, keep him in there longer um, to, to hear this guy with this, you know, very clear voice, obviously a very clear head. And he's reading, whether that's the book, the same book or not, he's reading something, mm -hmm. you know? So I was just, I was just blown away. So I, I have to agree. And now it makes me question his loyalty to Wilfred because I think he's, I think he's coherent mm -hmm. when all of this is going on. And mm -hmm. I think he knows that Wilfred's putting him through this torture. So it does make me wonder if his bonding with Josie might help down the road when something big happens. Yeah. And is that going to change things when, if, if there is some sort of plan for him to go out and get Melanie, you know, is that, uh, yeah. is that going to change things? If he realizes that he can, he can, uh, you know, uh, show up or, or outdo Mr. Wilford. I know. Yeah. I'm really excited about that because I feel like the the pieces, it's like I said about the puzzle. And you know mm -hmm. you get those puzzles where the pieces can go in multiple places or at least you think they can. So I'm starting uh -huh, to wonder right. if maybe this is one of those pieces that I thought was going to go over here in the Wilford pile mm -hmm. and now it could actually help Snowpiercer. So now yeah. I'm just kind of like, yeah. okay, hmm, where does it go? Where will it end up? You know, it's like a puzzle. It's like a chessboard. It's like checkers. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Some of the stuff that's <laughs> yeah. going on and trying to keep it all straight is really hard. Sometimes I feel like I need a whiteboard out so that I can. Yeah, exactly. A Venn Vin yeah, diagram. And start connecting <laughs> everything to try to figure it out because. I'm just so curious about where they're yeah. going and who the mole is, what's happening. Yeah. Is yeah. it someone we yeah, know? Exactly. Is it someone we don't know? Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. It's exciting. All right. So what is your next point? Well, uh, my next point, number four, is the new power couple. And to me, that is Ruth and Zara. Mm. First of all, I think Zara has a lot of control on this train. And I'll get to more of that later. But she mm -hmm. and Ruth seem to be, they're becoming BFFs. And yeah. Zara, I think, is proving to Ruth that she's trustworthy and that she can be counted on. I mean, she, one minute she's throwing up in a wastebasket. And the next minute mm -hmm. she's on there with this very cool, calm voice talking about, you know, talking about doing the announcements. Yeah, doing yeah, yeah. The grace under pressure was was really great. Yeah, 
So I really, really enjoyed watching their relationship advance. And, but still, I'm wondering, you know, Zara has, she's got a lot of control and that worries me and makes me excited at the same time. I'm just not sure how I feel yeah. about it. And I for, I had forgotten about her relationship with Miss Audrey from season yes. one. You know, that they were so close because then at the beginning, she's having this very personal conversation with Miss Audrey before she goes over to Big Alice. And and you can see that Zara is is she's really good at talking to people and getting people to talk mm -hmm. like she she Ruth, you know, Ruth says, you know, walk with me through hospitality. And and, and she's like, well, what are we going to do? And, and Ruth's like, well, I've got to compose my lie mm -hmm. or something, something like that, that I thought was great. And I just, and that I'm going to talk some more about Allison Wright <laughs> later. Cause she's like one of my points every week, it seems. Um, <laughs> but uh, I just absolutely loved the, yeah, there was so much in this that, uh, um, we could I know go this could be a four hour podcast, but we're not going to let exactly. it be. Exactly. I, ha we're not, I had a note about Zara and Ruth. Let me see if I, oh no, that's just, just the same thing we were talking about. Just that she, be, but still being able to get through the address. Yeah. So, so what's okay. your number four? Um, so, so my next one is just the, the whole plan with Miss Audrey. I, it, it took me the second watch to understand what was going, what was going on that, you know, Ben or Javi, whichever one it was, shows her the little communication box and says that the one in Wilford's engine, which is also his, his luxury apartment thing is, has a flaw that they fixed in Snowpiercer. And he very quickly, one time through shows her how to open the box, gives her this tool, shows her what wires to switch. And then that's it. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> That was a that wasn't super complicated, but that was a little bit more complicated than just you know do it. I, they should have given her a few more tries to find out how long it was going to take her, so she knew because she tried to do it when when he was going to go pour drinks, you know. And so I, I started to wonder if she, if one of the reasons she stays behind is not because she is back in his clutches, but because she wants a chance to do that wiring job. I think you could uh -huh. be right. I think we got a lot of Miss Audrey this week. I'm very mm -hmm. concerned for her. I am. I'm concerned because, you know, Wilford saw that screw that it was loose and he kind of fiddles with it before he goes after her. So I don't know you know, if he finds that tool or if he catches her doing it, or if maybe he already knows about the flaw and he's fixed it in Big Alice. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Uh, there's a, there's a whole lot of things to this that we're just going to have to wait and, and see. And I'm excited to see where it goes, but I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping really that, that my, my intuition uh, holds true that she didn't just stay because of him, but she stayed because she wants to try to fulfill her mission. I hope you're right. I feel like Lena Hall has really, I mean, I enjoyed her so much last year as Miss Audrey. And this mm -hmm. year, I feel like she's getting an opportunity to do even more. And so I'm excited mm -hmm. about that. She and Wilford have this weird relationship where I feel like he's obsessed with, I feel like he's obsessed with her. And she's addicted mm -hmm. to him, like he's a drug. And so right. even though I know she's being as strong as she can be, and she's really trying to keep un herself under control, I just worry that she's going to relapse. Mm -hmm. Because there's yeah. more to that relationship than we've seen. And what we have seen is yeah. very weird. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. And, you know, it, she spent all that time trying to get out of it. And so we've just got to see if she's managed to gather enough strength to stay out of it. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm afraid the longer she's away from everyone on Snowpiercer, the more susceptible yeah. she's going to be to him. Yep. He's very so. persuasive. He is. Maybe Alex can kind of ground her. I thought that was that was an interesting conversation between her where she said that I'm friends with your mom. You know, and, and Alex is like, well, that's, she's the enemy, yeah. you know, kind of thing. I thought and that was, that you? was interesting. And she says, I'm neutral. And I'm just thinking, I'm neutral. you're Switzerland. Mm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's what I think. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. 
So what is your next point? My number three is Josie as the informant. One mm. thing I just don't understand how she was able to stay awake without that medication during that procedure, which looked absolutely mm -hmm. beyond painful. Oh. And yeah. towards the end, when she was talking herself through things, she just kept saying blood, blood, blood. Mm hmm. And then she gets up and she's able to walk right after it. I know. You know, I mean, it just I don't know if that's an inconsistency in in the writing or if she's just that the character is just that. Tough. I think she's super tough. You know? I really think that she is. And I appreciated, though, Icy Bob giving her advice, like mm -hmm. telling her not to trust the Headwoods. Yeah. And, and that's yeah. where that was when I got the idea about the possible misdirection mm -hmm. of the of the conversation that maybe it was more to try to draw out who the spy is. But then then as I got to thinking more and more about that, I started to think it's like she would be the obvious spy. Mm -hmm. Right. Like she should be the obvious spy. And then like even Terrence figures it out. And we'll talk some more about Terrence and Pike, but even Terrence figures it out because Leighton makes one, one classic mistake that Leighton makes is he uses the same courier too many yes. times, you know, <laughs> and you can see that he kind of changed it up later because he uses a different courier to get that last message to him, you know, but still it just, it, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Josie as the informant was, She's so tough. Almost. And I, yeah. I was like squirming watching what they were doing. Oh, and yes. I'm just not sure what they're doing. It feels like they're pulling more skin off her. And are they going to replace it? I, I, yeah, I don't know. I couldn't get, they were spraying it with that stuff. And I don't know if that stuff regrows the skin or if it's like a, a you know, like we have liquid bandage. Yeah. You know, maybe it's kind of like a liquid bandage kind of thing that's going to, that'll, that'll just kind of fall off when the skin grows back. I don't know. It's, it's, uh, but it's definitely working because her face is a lot better. And she's getting up and moving you know? around. Like, I feel like mm -hmm. she's improving. Exactly. So I guess we'll yeah, see. For sure. Soon enough. Hopefully soon enough. Yes. Uh, so my next one is Till. Uh, I, I thought it was interesting that, they, that Roche and Leighton tell her to take a day off because she's kind of losing it. And uh, then she goes to that bar and she's talking to Osweiler. And this is the first, is this the first time we've seen Osweiler this season? I feel like he's been around, but I feel like it's the first time, but, you know, the communication. We saw him a couple times. Yeah. In this episode. But I didn't know who, I didn't recognize him because I didn't want rewatch season one. So I didn't know who he was until she said his name. And I went, oh, that's the other guy. Yeah. yeah he used to be with hospitality or with Till and the, in the, the, she was a, a brakeman, whatever, she was a roach. Yeah, yeah, a brakeman, right. She was a brakeman. Um, and he was the one that was, that was uh, getting, uh, yeah. He's I the know, one always getting in trouble, was. usually. He was yes, always getting in trouble. Yes. He was trading sexual favors for uh, for stuff with the Tailies to get them yes, stuff. Yes, and, so. and he uh, now has that relationship with Lila yeah. Folger Jr., who mm -hmm. is... Crazy. Yes. <laughs> I think that's a great adjective to describe her. Uh, she is off the rails. But it's almost the conversation they have at the bar is it's almost like he's an informant for her because she's kind of like, you know, keep your head up and... and and so I, I kind of wondered, is he maybe still kind of a brakeman or is she just using him because he's part of the janitor squad, um, you I know? Think so because they have that relationship from last year, last season, I feel like she really cares about him. So mm -hmm. I think she still has that connection because of their, right. their past together. So I think she's just relying. I think she's mostly relying on that. It's just yeah. weird to see okay. him, you know, go from being a brakeman to being in the janitor service. And same thing with right. LJ. It's like, what? This is just strange. <laughs> so strange. Exactly. <laughs> um, I, you know, I love the pastor kind of pulls her out of there and he has a, an interesting counseling kind of method for her. I guess he kind of tailors his counseling session to what you need. I know. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, takes her for a boxing a boxing match and uh, I love one of the things I realized and it was in the second and as I'm talking about it I realize it that a lot of these scenes played out across the entire episode yeah. 
Like we got little bits and pieces of each scene as the episode progressed. So the, the episode itself, now that I think about it, may have only like on the trains may have only actually covered like an hour. Yeah. If you think about it, it uh, not a lot of time has passed yeah. in this episode. No. And so I, I, I'm just realizing that now um, because, you know, it's towards the end when the pastor, when they're having that conversation, he does that quote from Jeremiah, which by the way is, is spot on. That verse is exactly how he quoted it. And it's all about the shepherds misguiding the flock and uh, and so obviously he's kind of implying that Leighton is is kind of misguiding with this sanctioning of Pike going to kill Terrence. But did he and, know? Uh, I, did he know that Pike went to kill Terrence? I don't know if he knew, but he obviously can see that Leighton is slowly. I don't know what the term is that I can think of to to explain it. I think he can see what's happening with Leighton. He can see that Leighton is compromising himself. He is. I feel things. like, yeah, and I feel I, like that's true. And I don't know how he's getting that information. If it's just through observation or if he's, you know, cause he is the pastor. So maybe there's more people than just till talking to him. Yeah. He is. So he makes me nervous. We don't yeah. know enough about him for me to trust him. And I have a feeling mm -hmm. he could be involved in the Wilford That's stuff. That's interesting. That's what makes me that nervous be... because I feel like he's he's a wild card in a train full and of wild that, cards. And that would be an interesting foreshadowing if it does turn out to that he's the one that's kind of a Wilf more because then the quote would apply to him yeah. as well. Being, being a poor shepherd. Yeah, Interesting. and I worried about Leighton keeping Till at arm's length. Not, I, It's mm -hmm. nothing against Till. I think Leighton is just, he's having a lot of struggles, and we can talk about that. That's one of my points coming up. Okay. All right, well, let's go to your next my point. My next then. point is the Big Alice Book Club <laughs> that no one wants to be a part of. And you know the funny thing, Steve? <laughs> It made me think of the book club that we're doing as as yes. part of our friend group. And I'm just <laughs> thinking, I'm so glad that that book club is not going to be like this one. Because I no. wouldn't want to do it. <laughs> it's The attendees look so uncomfortable. Yeah. And Wilfred, com I, oh my gosh. These comparisons of Wilfred, Snowpiercer, and the book... And I just mm -hmm. started wondering, and this is some of the stuff that I kind of got, I, I jotted down just a few things I was thinking. And the first one, mm -hmm. we know that Sean Bean is killing it as this complex and sinister sociopath villain that we're seeing. Right. But he connects with Rebecca in the novel. And I went and did some digging. I have not read that novel, so I went and did some digging about it. Oh, good. Because I did a very, I did a very, very light looking at it. So if you dug deeper, that's well, good. Well, the main thing is Rebecca in the novel, she is this cruel, selfish, and a bit of a sociopath herself. Oh. And the man that she, the main, the husband in the story, who mm -hmm. has gone on to marry another wife because he killed his first wife. And then at the end, his house is burning to the ground. Okay. Okay, so Rebecca, the, the title character, is not the wife. No, Rebecca is the dead okay. wife. Okay. Okay. Yes. Now that and makes sense. And if you sense. remember, Alex, I think it was Alex who pointed out, he killed his first wife and his house burns to the ground. Yes. Yeah, because I... Yeah. I, so what I'm trying to figure out is... Who is who in this book? Because I feel like he's connected to that book. He likes that book. Probably because Rebecca mm -hmm. herself was like him. So I'm wondering if he sees himself as Rebecca, if he sees himself as the husband, um, and it, mm -hmm. whatever role he's thinking of himself, is Audrey his narrator, who is the woman that he marries, if he's playing the part of the husband? Is Melanie Rebecca? I don't think so. 
And his big Alistair Snowpiercer, his, quote, Manderley, which is his big, massive mansion that was in the book. Okay. So I feel like there's a lot there. And so I need to stew on this a little bit more because I feel like it's very likely that none of this means anything. However, <laughs> given what happened with the Breachman in this episode, I'm not discounting mm -hmm. anything anymore. Yeah, at this point, uh, who knows? Who knows what what could be the... Yeah, that's an interesting to, to see if there's parallels between these characters in the book and in, in the show. We'll have to see. I think we'll have to see if they carry on, if they talk any more about, about the Rebecca book. I think book we need to find out. Or, or not. If um, Icy Bob was reading that book, too. Like I said, it looked to me, it really looked because it, it looked like it was the same. It looked the same. I, I am going to, sure, you so. know what, Steve, and I'm going to cut this out when I send it to Mark. I'm actually going to okay. look it up. Was I see okay. Bob reading Rebecca? <laughs> see what it says. Oh, no, it doesn't even say. Uh, okay. Um, well, you, you can't. Yeah. What? what book was I see Bob reading? Okay. Let's see. see if that gives you. It it's oh Wilfred Plunt. Ooh, no, I don't want to see that. Um, <laughs> I don't want to see someone else's theories. Like I like to come up with my own. Oh, there you go. Oh was yeah. Okay. Reading? Yeah, I I'm not really sure. It looked it the, the cover to me the second time looking at it. I didn't pause it or anything. So, right. Um, it looked like it was the same book, but it, you know it it might not have been. Uh, so that'll be interesting to see. Well, it, well, I guess the big thing we'll have to just see is see if it's referenced again. Yeah. Right? If it's not referenced again, if it's never referenced again, then it was just a scene to kind of show us the fear that people have of letting him down. Because you definitely, when when the when the one guy started to give a different opinion. Oh, he didn't like that. Other. Oh, he didn't like that at all. Yeah. No. No. He's like. He's like. This is a classic of British literature. You yeah. Know, or whatever. So. Uh, yeah, he okay. didn't like that at all. That really bothered him. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. I, I'm just, yeah, I'm just really, yeah. Interesting. It's gonna be, yeah. All right, so that brings us to my number two. All right, yes, your number two. I think so. Okay, so my number two is Ruth, and I think Allison Wright may just become a, a common <laughs> staple on my in, in my points every week because I just love what she's doing with this character. I love the emotion that we get to see on on her face, and every line that she delivers is just perfect to me. I, and you can see that she doesn't want to lie, but she knows she has to in order to keep hope alive. And it just, oh, it was, it was so good that just the subtle things she brings to this character um, just amaze me every week. The more and more we dig into it, we get to see more and more of her. And I just love that, that whole speech she gives that short monologue about Melanie's message. Like she could have just come on and said, we sent the balloon up. She could have done the same thing that Ben did with Wilford. We sent the balloon up. We got the ping mm -hmm. could have been done, but she knew that in order to inspire and keep the people hoping and keep their faith, she had to have this very flowery kind of speech. And, you know, the children are, are making this banner for Melanie and they're all so excited and they're looking up to her as a hero. And so she, she really wanted to keep that going. And I'm just now realizing that what she's doing is very similar to what Melanie was doing in the first season by yes. pretending to be Mr. Wilford. Now, in a way, Ruth is, she's not pretending to be Melanie, but she's pretending that she's hearing from Melanie and that she's getting all this, that, that Melanie is out there conveying all this stuff to yes. them. Yes, I agree. I agree with that. I think that, I think that Ruth is kind of a wild card and not in the same way as I talked about a, other wild cards, I'm thinking more along mm -hmm. the lines of, I think that she has more power than she thinks. And I think that she can influence. She has mm -hmm. a lot of influence. 
Yeah. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how she's able to use that influence. Because right now she seems to be fighting this battle with Leighton. This silent mm -hmm. battle where she's just trying to get him to pay attention. Not pay attention. She's trying to get him to let her in. To tr Yes, to trust her. Because she, she that's what she said. Was it last episode or was it this episode? She said that to Zara that she said, I trust him, but trust he doesn't me. trust me yet. Yes. And so maybe this, her doing this will give him will inspire him to put his, his trust. Yes. In her, you know, so maybe that's part of what she's trying to do. I hope so. I hope that they can learn to trust each other because I feel like when you go up against Wilfred, and I think I said this last week, when you go up against Wilfred, mm -hmm. you've got to have all your parts and pieces together. You've got to do it as a unit. You can't be split. Right. Exactly. And now I feel like there's a lot of splits happening on Snowpiercer, there's a lot of mistrust and a lot of stress. I'm not. And now we've got to kind of bring it back yeah. together. So these next episodes will bring us back. I hope back. so. I'm excited. Hope so. <laughs> All right. So what is your top My one? My top one is, and we've talked about this a little bit, Leighton's struggle with leadership. Because mm -hmm. I think when he was being the detective last season, I feel like that was his role kind of like this public servant, not in this leadership role like Melanie, but more of the people's person. Like, I feel like he was the person that was more representative of the people. Not necessarily yeah. like a leader. He, he was, I would say, like if I, to use a baseball metaphor, and I'm not normally a baseball sports guy, last season he was at the plate. Mm-hmm. He was the batter. He was driving a, a lot of the story, and he had his own individual achievement to make. Yeah, of solving this, of solving this crime. Now he's on, not on the sideline necessarily. He's not necessarily a coach. He's maybe he's a catcher, kind of trying to direct what's going on, but that's not the right role. For yeah, him. and he realizes that it's not the right role. Yeah, agreed. Uh, and he's struggling with it, you know? I think mm -hmm. he's really struggling with how to move forward. Because without Melanie, he's got... He doesn't have a leader to talk with, a real leader. And to advise him during this. And I right. feel like Melanie did advise him. And I f Melanie would have been great to still be at his side. And yes. I feel like that there is a lot of pressure on him he's got to balance all of these things he's got the tail he's expecting for there to be some sort of comeuppance at some point for melanie i think mm -hmm. because of josie right he's got that he has to weigh out he's got the first class passengers expecting to continue their lap of luxury life mm -hmm. but they're not real happy with leighton as a leader and then right. you've got the second and third class passengers. Well, third class is a mess with Terrence. Right. Which we'll talk about in a second because that's part of my latent struggle with leadership. Um, yes. Yeah. So I feel yeah. like. Well, yeah. now there's going to be a vacuum. There's going to be a vacuum oh, there now as well. Yeah. So yeah. So he. He's going to step up. Zara actually put the bug in his ear when he found out that Terrence realized that Josie was the one sending the messages. Mm -hmm. He's the one, you know, Zara said to him, you need to figure out how to do this. This needs to get done because it's putting yeah, everything she, at risk. She, yeah. She wanted, she knew that Terrence needed to be killed. Yeah. Right. Like that was her first instinct was she knew. And so she put that into his ear and she said, and you've got the person to do it. Yeah. You just got to sanction yep. it. You don't have to order it. Yeah. Just sanction it, you know? So. And that was a hard conversation for him to have with Pike. Because mm -hmm. Pike, I think, is trying to be a better person in some ways. And I feel like, you know, when he went in to 
kill Terrence, he gives him a knife because he wants it to be fair because he has to right. live with this after he does it. And right. we also right. learn a little nugget in that conversation, which was that Leighton saved Pike's life because they wanted to kill him when he was a cannibal, which that ties mm -hmm. back to, if you think about the movie, that happened in the movie with the cannibals and babies. Right. And, yeah, all strange I hadn't stuff. thought about that until he, until he brought it up because I don't remember if there was something specific last season or if it was prior. So it must have been prior to last season. Yeah. Pike must have been part of the group because remember they killed the leader mm -hmm. of the cannibal group yeah. and ate his heart. Yeah. But so Pike must have been part of that group. Yes. Just he wasn't the mm -hmm. leader of that group. So that's that's an interesting take on Pike's yes. character. And then you know the the method with what he did there. Oh, and I boy. couldn't get it. <laughs> Watching it both times, I was trying to figure out. So Terrence splashes him with the, the tea yes. or whatever was in that glass and then grabs the knife or starts or did he grab the knife or did he not grab the knife? Um because it's it seemed like he was slashing he, at him. Okay, so he was he was trying to he attack him. He was trying to him. attack him with a knife. Uh, but in the end, Pike uh Pike filled him full of something. Yeah, whatever was in that in that that gun, and I couldn't figure out if that was a like a some sort of caulking gun or clean. I don't know. I couldn't figure out what that was any time I watched it. So I may have to watch the episode again and try to figure out that fight because it was it was a little confusing that Pike went to that method. Yeah, I found that a little you know, strange. Um, but you know what? He may just have had to use what he had at his disposal. Yeah, he may have dropped his knife when when Terrence was slashing at him. You know, I don't know. And uh, uh, so it's it's going to be interesting too to see next episode. Are they going to, you know, how is Till going to respond to this? Yeah, because this is now is this a murder in investigation? Is is Leighton going to just tell her straight up that he sent Pike in there to kill Terrence? Are they going to try to cover it up? You know, you know, what are they going to do? I don't know if they can address it because they have got this huge mass murder of the breachmen now. Mm -hmm. That's on, That's top, on top of, of this. Yeah. And right. Till was already feeling really stressed out about trying to find the, out the, who chopped off Lights, Lights his fingers. fingers. So right. This is going to be a much bigger thing. I feel like it's almost like they've got to get this on. This piece is bigger and they've got to get it mm -hmm. under control now. They really yeah. can't afford yeah. to wait. Yeah. So I, so it's, it's going to be interesting next episode to see where, where they go with it and how they go yeah. with it. Agreed. I'm, I'm interested. I'm, I'm certainly interested. Um, yeah. I'm just not sure. Where it's going, but I guess we'll see. <laughs> so, do you have some more there? No, nope, that was it. So we. I'm looking. I'm looking at my notes because we covered most of what I had to talk about already. We just talked about Pike. That was what I was going to bring mm -hmm. up. My number one, we already talked about. That was the attack on the the breachman. Yep. Um, the only the only other little note I've got that we really haven't talked about already, and I think you've got some of the music as well, is just that because I got high. <laughs> um, every time I heard it, I had like the first the very first time I heard it, literally I watched it in the morning mm -hmm. uh, on Tuesday morning, and literally that song was stuck in my head that... all day. like all day Tuesday. All I had was because I got high, <laughs> I was gonna get up and clean the room, but I was uh, you, know, you know that so. is an earworm. <laughs> That it just is. gets in it there, is. and yeah, it gets in there. And there's yeah. some suggestive lyrics in yes. there if you listen to the explicit version. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, Lena Hall <laughs> actually has four songs. She actually did sing four of the songs that were nice. included in this week's episode. I think there were a total of nine that were included, okay. including House of the Rising Sun, which was... Oh, that was her. So she was the one singing that at yes. the end. That was her during okay. that montage wondered... of all the killing with the bre of the um all the killing of the breachmen. Wow, she can get yes, low. She can. I, 
that's 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 pretty good for a, a girl or woman to to be able to get low like that. And because I I thought it was a guy. Well, according uh, to according to the website I went to, it was a TV music mm-hmm. website. Um, it was her. Okay, no, I'll. I'll, I'll I'm not saying it, it yeah. couldn't have been her. I'm just saying when I first when I first heard it, I really thought it was a it, it was a a guy mm-hmm. cover of it. So, but now hearing that it was her, that's that's even that's she she's even better singer I than know. I thought. She's really great. So. I like her. I, I feel like she's killing it this season. I guess that's my common adjective for people because I just said <laughs> earlier that Sean Bean was killing it as well. So, <laughs> yeah, I really enjoyed that. You know, too, Steve, we learned that the last Australian actually has a name. Yes. Mary. And I love that, <laughs> that you bring this up because this is one of those those things that when I saw when I saw Amelia take that first note uh, from Josie in the close, I went, oh, so that did work out. The whole thing with her and the Australian, <laughs> they they have. Uh, so there's more to than just Josie. There's a whole network over there in Big Alice at the well, maybe not a whole network. It's probably like three people, but still, yeah. but like, um, you know, it, it was it was interesting to see that, and I love that little talk with her and Alice, uh, her and Alex, like you said, because we get this impression that she. I wonder if she has as much as Wilford. She's helped raise Alex. You, you know, know, I wonder about and, that because she's not much. I don't feel like she's much older than Alex either. So they might be. Whereas they're not classmate contemporaries like LJ and and Alex were, but they may have more of a sisterly yes. kind of kind that's of relationship. That's kind of what I think. I mean, that's what it looks like to me. Like it's a sisterly relationship. Yeah. It just yeah, it seems yeah, it seems like a sisterly relationship. Yeah. Um, so are there anything else in your notes there that we haven't discussed already? Mm, No, we've talked about just, yeah, we've talked about everything. Um, yeah, I feel like we've covered it all. Uh, So let's, let's, let's go into some quotes. Um, do you want to start? Sure. So, um, I see Bob, one of his great quotes where he's helping, um, Josie figure out how to handle the pain that goes around things and not just the pain, but the panic. And he Mm -hmm. says, the trick is to externalize the pain. Don't internalize it or it will paralyze you. So I thought that was really good advice. Who knew? I like that. I see Bob could talk like this. I just crazy. It was, it blew my mind every time. Like, like, even the second time watching it, when I heard his voice start, I went, who is that? Oh, yeah, that's I see Bob. Yeah. Um, so my first one is just when when they're at the beginning, when Ruth and uh, Zara walk in and she says, Tristan, you are fired from the address service. <laughs> and he's like, oh, thank God. You know, you can just tell that he's stressed out, did not like doing this, this addressing <laughs> this address. So I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah, he was pretty happy to be fired. Yes. For sure. Um, yeah, my second one is when Till meets Pastor Logan and they go back to his place. She seemed a little surprised that uh, yeah. she saw him in the bar and he said, I just met you in a bar. I go where I'm least expected. I like that. I like that good, too. It's a good line for a pastor. Yeah. yeah. Um, my second one is it's Alex talking to Miss Audrey and she says he tortures us with your albums all day. Are all those songs really about him? <laughs> and I think she She's, says something like most of them yeah. or something like that. Yeah. For sure. Um, then I have the next one I have is uh, Terrence and Pike. Oh, yeah. And Pike goes in with a knife to give it to Terrence and wants it to be a fair fight. Terrence says, you come here to kill me and you want it to be fair. And Pike says, it's a tail thing. I like that. I, I liked that. The, the second, I didn't realize it the first time, but the second time I, I watched, I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. It's a tail thing. And we're getting a lot of that. It, I realized in this episode too, um, even with, with Leighton or this season, really where Leighton's had to remind them that he's still a taily. He's not, you know, just because he's leading the train, he still considers himself a tailor. Yes. So, um, let's see. My uh, my last one 
is I loved again. It's it's a line from Ruth, and I I just it touched me when the way she said it and the way she delivered it was so perfect. When she said, "Even I've done things in teal that I'm ashamed of." Yeah, and I didn't realize that color was teal. It is. I think it's more <laughs> of a turquoise, actually. But well, yeah, we all look at things differently, so we- I guess. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So we did get some feedback uh, this week from our Facebook page. Wonderful. This is from Teresa. Thank you so much, Teresa. She says, I'm finally caught up. Holy shit, I'm loving this season. It's more intense than last season. I love the movie and I love this series. I hate the way they end the episodes like in the middle of a crazy action deepness. It's like turning to another page in a book and no more pages. LOL. They better not do it on the last episode of the season. I will be really mad, but (laughs) damn, this last episode five was cutthroat and I put pun intended or not. (laughs) That's and she follows it up with she loved it. Oh, so. good. I feel like <laughs> I feel yeah. like you know I talked about it a couple episodes ago. With the second season of a show, it's so makes me nervous that there's going to be like that sophomore slump where the second mm-hmm. season is not as good as the first. But I feel like this one yeah. is still really chugging along, and I like it. So I'm excited. Yeah. To see what happens, I'm ex- I'm excited to to see, and I'm uh, uh, you know I'm excited to see where it goes from here, and I'm excited that uh, we know that there's a third season coming someday. I know. You know uh, I I'm confident that they're going to end this this one really really well. So me too. I'm excited. All right. <laughs> anything else from anything else from this episode that you have to add? Um. No, I think. Everything. I think we talked about everything. The only other thing I can think of is when Miss Audrey was walking from the night car to go through the tail section to go to Big Alice, she, everyone was just in awe of her. And I just thought that was a really cool shot visually of that. Yeah. Yeah. Of that. Um, I'm going to start trying to pay attention to the way they're shooting it. Cause I, it feels like they're, they're putting some sort of filter on the lens yeah. or, or some sort of filter on it digitally. That's softening yeah. everything or, or it, even on big Alice, it feels like there's, there's softer yeah. colors uh, going on. So I'm going to pay attention to that. Or it's try such to pay a contrast though. If you think the train is just the silver gray and outside mm-hmm. is white with the ice and the snow and, yeah. Then the inside. You see Wilford's car is all these robust, beautiful colors. Mm-hmm. And then you see the teal uniforms that are so, like, they stand out so much against everything, you know, yeah. closer, especially up front, where it's all white and very sterile looking. It just, it pops, I guess. Yeah. Um, I have one podcast recommendation. I, I listened to Michael Rosenbaum's uh, Inside of You. It, Michael Rosenbaum, if you don't know, he was on Smallville. He's been in a lot of TV shows. And um, he does a podcast called Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. And uh, I love to just, I, you know, I just go back and I find sometimes I don't necessarily do the current week. I'll just look at some older interview that he did uh, just to listen to. So if, you, if you're interested in that, scroll through and look at all. He's got lots of episodes. I don't know what the count, the final count is, but there was one funny thing that happened this week. He was talking to Katie Cassidy and at the end of it, he always ends the, the interview with, thank you for letting me be inside of you. <laughs> and, that's that's uh, interesting. You can tell <laughs> that, that, uh, Katie's response was, what? what? What did you just say? <laughs> <laughs> and and he just literally skips right over just it and just goes going. on yeah. to finish out the podcast because uh, I thought it was it was hilarious that she didn't uh, didn't realize he was going to say that. That's kind <laughs> so, of comical. I yeah. think um, for me this week, if anyone doesn't listen to Strange Indeed, they had a fantastic interview this week with Brad William Henke who played Tom Cullen in the Stand miniseries on CBS All Access. And so Rima and Ben, it was just such a wonderful, like, thir- I think it was like 30 minutes of yeah, some candid discussion. And I enjoyed it a lot. And so I think people should check it out. It was really good. And I, I'll give credit to Rima. She did a lot better with her first uh, celebrity interview than I did. <laughs> I I was a complete moron when Mark and I <laughs> talked to the comic no, book men. No, so, wasn't that uh, bad, Steve? Uh, but, 
<laughs> Thank you. I haven't listened to it because I knew uh, I appreciate somebody saying it wasn't that bad. You know, but, man, I, I make a habit, Steve. I don't ever. <laughs> I edit uh, Run for Your Lives, and I never listen yeah. to it after. Like I just don't. <laughs> I at the beginning for a long time I listened to Mark and I's because I wanted to s- get better mm-hmm. at it. So I would listen to myself and and hear. Not just the way I talk, because I, you know, stutter. We all do that. But I mean, just as far as trying to not step over people and not interrupt and that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't as much now because I feel like I've learned, but I need to to continue that because that's that's how you get better. Is you you listen and you hear where you kind of mess up or where you not where you think you mess up. I mean, obviously, it's is what it is. It's a conversation. That's all we're yeah. having. Yeah, uh, I think to. It, but yeah, no. Yeah, I, for me. I think when I first started podcasting, I watched the video because I record on Zoom and Mm -hmm. it helped me. I figured out what I was doing because I kept hearing this little noise. I'm like, what is that noise? And I figured out by watching the video what I was doing. And that was really neat. And I, I, you're right. I think that listening does help. Does help you get better. Well, and you're editing, you're, you're listening to it as you're editing yeah. it. And I know Mark, Mark one time told me uh, that he edits me better than he edits himself. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I just, I appreciate everything Mark does to edit. And I appreciate what you're doing uh, with this uh, podcast as well. I, I really, really love uh, doing it with you. And oh, uh, thanks. Oh, can't wait to continue uh, the rest of this it's season. It's going to be fun. I'm really excited yes. to see where this all takes us. I feel like we're on Snowpiercer ourselves. Just trying to fit. We've got like this. Last week I felt like (laughs) I feel like we're we have a front row seat, and we're just we don't get to participate in the show, but we're just kind of watching, and listening, and trying to piece it together. So. Well, if you would like to send us some feedback as Teresa did, and we appreciate Teresa's feedback, you can send that to our email address, which is panels to pixels one at gmail.com. That's panels to pixels one, the TO spelled out right in the middle and the number one at gmail.com. You can also do as Teresa did and go to our Facebook page. I will try to be better about putting up a post for feedback. Uh, on there, but that is facebook.com slash panels to pixels. You can check out our YouTube page. You can leave us a comment there. Uh, there's many ways you can interact with us. We don't have a Twitter or Instagram yet, yet, <laughs> but check us out uh, on those different podcast players. Give us a review if you could. Next week, we're going to continue our coverage, obviously, with episode six and that one will be just a few days away. We're recording this on Thursday night. And uh, it'll be Monday. It's, I know. We'll be here before so you excited. know. It. <laughs> ah, all right. Well, other than that, you. Uh, how else can our listeners hear you, Daphne? I think you already mentioned it, but you can it hear again. me on Run for Your Lives. Paik and I have celebrated 25 episodes, and I think the episode that will be out when this is online will be the faculty, and it's actually episode number 27. Got some great feedback for that already. I'm looking forward to uh, releasing that episode. And we've got some great fun ones coming up as well. I'm excited. I sent you a feedback uh, for the faculty and I'm excited to hear what I said because I don't remember. <laughs> um, and I'm excited to hear you guys talk about the faculty because I, I like it and watching it twice in just a, a couple of months, I appreciate it even more. So it's, it's, it's really good. It's one of good. those fun ones. It's a fun, yes. it's got a little bit of humor and a little bit of sass, I think. So I really like it. And one of the few movie roles for Jon Stewart. Yes. I forgot yeah. he was in it. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, again, thank you everyone for listening. Uh, I'm Steve. And I'm Daphne. And this was Panels to Pixels, and we will see you on the next panel. Good night. Good night. Good night.